Hello, everybody. I'm Martha Minow, still the dean. And it is my great, great pleasure and honor to introduce the Justice Antonin Scalia Lecture. This is a new lecture series. It was established uh, at the law school, and this is only the second one ever to happen, given by an anonymous donor to promote and advance understanding of the founding principles and core doctrines of the United States Constitution. The speakers are drawn from fields of political science, history, philosophy, law, government, religion, and related disciplines, although this is only the second speaker, and boy, we've set a very high standard. The person chosen to give the Scalia Lecture should be a scholar or figure of high distinction who, through his or her work, research, writings, and teaching, elucidates the principles of America. I can't imagine a better person for this than Justice Elena Kagan. And we are so honored to have Justice Scalia's sparring partner, hunting partner, and friend to join us here. To call Justice Kagan a friend of Harvard Law School, of course, is an understatement. You all know uh, her as an alum, as a professor, as the transformative dean who brought us so many things, including this very building and this very room. But we can talk about that another occasion. We are so grateful to you, Justice Kagan, for being here. She will be interviewed by our very own and very beloved John Manning. John Manning, the Bruce Bromley Professor of Law, who is also the Vice Dean, also a distinguished uh, contributor to the understanding of American law, American constitutional law, administrative law. I'm going to shut up because you're not here to hear me. But I will say this. These two people, these two people have been living through and helping to shape the revolution in how statutes are interpreted in the United States and how that interpretation actually reflects our fundamental principles of government. Watch it and learn. Thank you so much. That sounds important, John. We better put on the yeah, show here. Ser seriously. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> thank you, Dean Minow. Uh, so Justice Kagan, very nice to see you. Uh, thank you very again for being here. Um, so let's just jump right into the statutory interpretation questions, which is what everybody is here to hear. Uh, my, my first one is this. We can't chit chat first. I, I think we'll just go right into <laughs> statutes. <laughs> That's what the poster says. Okay. Um, so, um, so you and I actually went to law school together. Uh, I was class of 1985. You were class of 1986. A as you know, um, and um, uh, that means I'm younger. Yes, uh, that that is true. Um, uh, so I, I thought I'd start by asking, what was statutory interpretation like in our day when we were law students? It was very different from the way uh, we teach statutory interpretation here at the Harvard Law School today in 2016. So what what was it like from the perspective of the class of 1986. I'm not sure if somebody had said to me uh, statutory interpretation, I would even really quite have known what that meant. I mean, it was not really taught as a subject, as a discipline. Um, you sort of had to pick it up where you could. I was, um, you, know, uh, you know, there was there was no leg reg kind of course in the way that students here and in other law schools have it. All of the first year was, um, or almost all of the first year was common law subjects, so you never had really to deal with the question of how to read a statute. I think that the first time I started thinking about a statute, funnily enough, was in my tax class in, uh, in my second year of law school. And it's like, oh, that's a statute, and it's all complicated and, and hard to read. and has words. And it has, <laughs> it has <laughs> words that you have to make sense out of. Um, and you know, I got through three years of law school, no problem, without anybody really ever saying anything to me about the method of statutory interpretation or about possible methods and the choice between them and among them. I think um, uh, to the extent that people uh, talked about statutes, uh, to the extent that they did, I mean, the first point, I guess, is that they just didn't. But to the extent that they did, the enterprise was very different, too. 
And uh, here we are in the Scalia lecture, and I would say that Justice Scalia had more to do with this than anybody. That, uh, that it was very, you know, you know um, gosh, what should this statute be? Uh, uh, more than uh, what do the words on the paper say? How do we decide what they say? How do we decide how to uh, give effect to them? It was much more policy oriented, like we're, like we're pretending to be congressmen as opposed to what I think of now as statutory interpretation is, you know, where uh, I'm a judge trying to figure out um, uh, how, to, how, to, how to give meaning, how to interpret, how to understand a text. So, so back in, in the day, there was less focus on what the role of the courts was in the enterprise. What was their legitimate job in interpreting statutes? And it was more about the particular moment of what what makes sense. Is that a fair yeah, statement? Yeah, I think that's probably true. I mean, obviously part of it is just, uh, you, you, you know, that here we are in law school and we think we're sort of the masters of the universe trying to figure out um, what the world could be like. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a place for that. There's, uh, but, but yes, I think that there was just not a whole lot of attention uh, to the fact that when judges confront a statutory text, they, uh, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not the writers of that text. They shouldn't be able to rewrite that text. That there is a text that's, that somebody, the, the lawmakers, has put in front of them. And that what you do with that text is a very different enterprise than the enterprise that Congress has gone, uh, has, has, has undertaken in writing the text. And I think probably there wasn't that conversation about the difference in role to the extent that there is today. So you said a moment ago that Justice Scalia ushered in a, a change in attitude. So I, I guess I'd have uh, two follow-up questions to, to, to my last one, which is, uh, which are one, um, you know, how would you characterize what your court does now? Sort of the way of thinking about statutes. You know, what just in practical terms, when you get a statutory case. You know, how does your court approach it? And then I, I guess the second is, you know, sort of how do you how do you feel that Justice Scalia? You know, you said that he shaped this more than anyone else. So wh what do you think that? How did he shape the way you know eight other justices do business? Yeah. So I, I think Justice Scalia is an incredibly important figure in the court in um, in many ways. I mean, you know, we all sort of like to think, oh, we're Supreme Court justices. That kind of you know. You are. Uh, but yeah. yeah. But, you know, the truth <laughs> of the matter is you wake up in 100 years and most people are not going to know most of our names. But I think that that is really not the case with Justice Scalia, who I think is going to go down as one of the most important, most historic figures in the court. And there are a whole number of reasons for that, which, you know, this is about statutes, so let's just, but, but I think the primary reason for that is that Justice Scalia has uh, taught everybody how to do statutory interpretation differently. And I really do mean pretty much taught everybody. Um, uh, you know, there's that, that classic phrase that uh, we're all realists now. Um, well, I think we're all textualists now in a way that just, you know, c was, was not remotely true uh, when Justice Scalia joined the bench. And e even, even Justice Breyer? Well, Justice Breyer <laughs> might be a little bit of an outlier. Uh, might be a little bit, uh, you know. In 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 certain ways, uh, he too starts with the text. Okay. You know, Justice Scalia, for that matter, is a little bit of an outlier in ways that we can talk about um, on 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 the on the current court. But but what I think sometimes he doesn't really understand is how much the center of gravity has moved towards the kinds of things that he's uh, preached for quite some time even at the same time as he's still a little bit on the edge of, uh, of a spectrum. But his focus on statutory texts, on the idea that, uh, yes, um, Congress has written something, and your job truly is to read and interpret and, and it, and that means staring at the words on the page. And um, uh, y you know, it's, it's actually remarkable to me how different that is than, uh, than what used to be. I'll give, I'll give you an example. Sure. So this was my first year on the court. It's a case called uh, Milner. Um, and 
And it was, it was sort of, a, it was just fascinating to me. It was a real sort of eye opener. It was, a, it was a case about FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, and particularly about um, one exemption in FOIA. Basically what FOIA does is to say that the government, there's a, a very broad ranging obligation for the government to disclose information. And then it has a number of exceptions um, uh, of what kinds of information the government doesn't have to look, disclose. And this case dealt with exemption two, which I'm going to say has something to do with the personnel practices and rules of an agency. So personnel rules and practices or something like that. And, um, but from that, somehow, the lower courts had created this whole gigantic superstructure of all these other things that agencies didn't have to disclose, not just stuff relating to their own personnel procedures, but pretty much anything whose disclosure would somehow interfere with an agency's operations, all right? Um, and, and when you read the opinions, and these were opinions by really fantastic judges, excellent judges on the DC circuit and elsewhere. But when you read the opinions, um, they were like, you know, they didn't get to the text of exemption two until like page 17 in a footnote someplace. They were mostly. And they didn't really talk about it seriously even then. Even yes. then, right? Because they <laughs> wouldn't true. have done what they did. Had, well. I mean, they were mostly about, they were mostly about two things. I mean, extensive, extensive, uh, things about uh, legislative history, like everything that Congress, and everything that every member of Congress might have been thinking about when they wrote those, I think it was like 15 words or something? 12. 12, was it 12 words? 12, okay. yes. So Milner, I've written about Milner twice, yes. 12, 12 simple words, okay. yes. Uh, uh, <coughs> and then, you know, a lot about maybe like, like grand, uh, purposes or just, you know, what Congress must have been thinking or something like that, uh, you know, what, uh, which re was really sort of like what makes sense to us. Um, and it was just a wildly different form of interpretation than anything written by anybody on the Supreme Court now. And I remember I walked into, I was assigned this opinion, it was one of my earliest assignments. I walked into conference one day and I was, uh, Justice Scalia and I are on the same hall, and we often sort of like walk, in, walk down that hall and walk into conference together. And I said to him, I said, it was such an eye-opener for me, just sort of seeing this old-time statutory interpretation and how much his, uh, I think he, you know, changed it such that you could, you, can't, you just couldn't imagine anybody writing the kinds of opinions that I was sitting there reading uh, in preparation for writing this opinion. And of course, what I said in the opinion was that they were all wrong, that this was just not the way to do statutory interpretation. Well, so let, let, me, let me ask you a, a question about that, uh, push you on that a little bit. So that here, I, I, this is a, 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 an opinion that I've, I've read many times, and the exemption, exemption two uh, governs um, records that are related solely to the internal personnel rules and practices uh, of an agency. And you know, what the DC Circuit had said is, well, you know, uh, the, the personnel, what we, what we worry about is things that personnel do. And so what was at issue in this case was um, what are called ordinance maps, right? So the Navy has these maps that tell you something very important, which is how far apart to store the bombs so that if one goes off, the rest of them don't go off, right? It's, it's how far apart you, you store them so you don't have a chain reaction. You, you can see why the government would not yeah, have wanted so the to disclose these things. So, so it's, it's probably something the government shouldn't disclose, right? Yeah. And it's probably something that a sensible mm -hmm. statute wouldn't require them to disclose. And, and what the government said was, you know, you know, personnel use these maps, <laughs> right, to decide how far apart to store the bombs. And the D.C. Circuit had developed this thing that had been on the books for about 30 years and Congress hadn't changed it. And so what Justice Breyer said, he was the, he was the lone dissenter. And what he said right. is, look, our obligation is to interpret a statute like the Freedom of Information Act to make sense. And, and in particular, to indulge Congress kind of the presumption that it's coming up with a sensible 
system of disclosure, what to disclose and what not to disclose. So why, why do the 12 simple words trump that kind of commonsensical approach to statutes? Well, you know, mostly, I guess, because, I mean, I hate to be simplistic about this, but mostly because Congress wrote the 12 simple words and didn't write the kind of statute that I think Justice Breyer had in mind. I mean, Justice Breyer's opinion, it's a very fine opinion, and it presents a different view of how to understand uh, the enterprise. But I, I think, you know, as the opinions reveal, uh, 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 not my view. I mean, it would be one thing if Congress had said, it's a possible kind of statute to pass. Congress had said, um, we think that, uh, that the government should disclose uh, uh, everything except things that it would be unreasonable to disclose, right? I mean, you could write. It does it sometimes, sure. You could right? write yeah, a statute sure. like that. There are plenty of statutes yeah. that, in somewhat fancier language, basically say the inquiry is one into reasonableness, and 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 those statutes essentially delegate to maybe it's to the agency or maybe it's to the court, depending on the kind of statute. Delegates an inquiry of the kind that I think Justice Breyer would have wanted to carry out, which is, is this reasonable, and should the agency have to disclose it, and would it be a better world if the agency uh, were able to uh, keep it secret rather than disclose it? But Congress just didn't write that statute in this case. Congress wrote a statute which is quite clear that there's this extremely broad disclosure obligation, except with respect to uh, very specific enumerated exceptions. And, you know, there's some play in the joints of each of those exceptions, but not nearly as much play in the joints as a statute that just says, do what seems reasonable so, would so give you. So and you, I think that matters, right? That Congress has decided which way it wants to do this and how much discretion it wants to give to whether it's an agency or a court to decide you know, what makes sense. And, and to turn it into a statute that's just about, oh, we get to decide what's reasonable, is, is really to, you know, usurp Congress's role. So, so Congress could have left it to the courts or the agencies to st strike the balance of what should be disclosed and what shouldn't, but you're saying Congress actually in this case chose to strike the balance itself and did so in a very detailed way. Uh, and a, a better and more concise way of saying that. I'm so, saying what so, I tried to say. Oh, so could I? Can you just come around with me, you know? <laughs> and I'll like speak in like long paragraphs and you'll just sort of get to the nub of the thing? I, I, th I think that would be a good job, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, so I'm going to ask you a... You're maybe, blushing. I made you blush, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I should be blushing. <laughs> um, so, so, Your Honor, may, may I, so uh, this may be a, 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 a bit of a, a, a bit of a delicate question, but you, you kind of sound like a textualist. Would you, would you describe yourself as a textualist? Yeah, I think I would. Uh, I think I'm, I'm pretty textualist. I'm very textualist in orientation. Now, I'll give you a couple of caveats to that, which I think honestly oughtn't to be caveats. I mean, p it should be just things that people understand as part of the textualist enterprise. But because some people don't, I'll express them as caveats. Um, uh, and the first is that, uh, and I guess these are related, but um, is that uh, to do textual interpretation is to look at a whole text, right? And I think uh, everybody on the court says this, and we sometimes disagree about what this means and about the extent to do it, but I think everybody on the court uh, recognizes that this is true, that even when the question is about what a single word means or what a single phrase means, that the way to uh, figure out that question is not just to stare at that single word or phrase. You don't put blinders on sure. that when you do textualist interpretation, you look at that phrase, but also many other phrases that share common features of uh, the word or phrase that you're looking at. You look at the design and structure of the statute as a whole to see what the statute is trying to do and how this particular phrase fits with what the statute is, uh, is doing. Uh, and, uh, and so you do. You look to context and structure, and that's a critically important part of textualist interpretation. Uh, 
uh, as I think uh, people now sensibly do it. And I guess the, the thing that's sort of related to that, it's really just part of the same, is that I like to think that, uh, you know, that there's, that textualism involves some amount of common sense, which is to say that, you know, if your understanding of some word or phrase would produce some result that seems pretty nuts, and nuts in the, con in the context of a statute, of the statute mostly is what I mean, um, uh, then you should just look at, I mean, ask yourself whether you're appropriately looking at but, but, the but entire statute. But Congress does do nutty things sometimes, Congress right? Sometimes you guys have well, to enforce. Well, I mean, Milner is a good example of that. Now, the fact that Congress did not have an exemption that covers those ordinances, ordinance maps. I mean, in Milner, the last page of that opinion basically says, you know, it kind of we think Congress ought to have an exemption that covers things like this. And basically said to Congress, you might want to think about that and pass something. So yes, absolutely. It's not like you get some Trump card. But it is uh, uh, that you should, you know, uh, that you should refrain from just, you know, when you look at a word and you say that obviously means X. And then that X defeats the entire function of the statute. You should look a little bit harder. It's a and, gut. It's a gut check, basically. I, I think, yeah. Uh -huh. But it's also it's just a reminder that it's not just a word. It's 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 a it's a statute as a whole, and that you have to make sense of a statute as a whole. So, do you think there's? So you you said earlier that you think that. There are outliers on either side of the court, and then there's a, a, a sort of a large center that has a, a, a consensus on this. What do you think is the big difference between, for example, the way you practice textualism and the way Justice Scalia practices textualism? Is there much of a difference, or is it? Uh, well, I guess I would say uh, two things. And one's sort of easy to explain, and then the other's a little bit harder. Um, I mean, the one way in which Justice Scalia, I think, is a bit of an outlier now, although, as, as I said, I mean, the, the court has moved so far in Justice Scalia's sure. direction. I mean, if Justice, sometimes I think about Justice Scalia, that he should just declare victory every once in a while, you know? <laughs> Rather than, like, obsess I, over I, I these, sometimes think that also, obsess yes. Obsess over <laughs> these little things that people aren't doing exactly the way he wants <laughs> them to be done. But, uh, <laughs> but one of those little things, right, is that Justice Scalia really never uses uh, legislative history and really has an allergy to uh, legislative history of any kind in any context. You know, he literally has an allergy. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and so people will do things uh, uh, like write, they'll, they'll write footnotes or they'll write paragraphs about legislative history and they'll put in the following phrase. For those who care about such things, and then they'll go on, right? And that's so that Justice Scalia can join the opinion as a whole because he'll just say, I don't care about those things. <laughs> so it's not committing me to anything, right? Or he'll uh, sometimes. He, sometimes he still needs to drop a footnote. Sometimes he does. <laughs> sometimes he like, will ask you to put something in a footnote and then he won't join the footnote right. or something like that. <laughs> you know, because, uh, and so, so uh, n now, uh, this difference can can be uh, exaggerated because, like, I'm not such a fan of legislative history myself, honestly. And I mean, we can talk about that. If yes, we, if I, you, I'm, if I'm you all want. I'm all set. But uh, but <laughs> but but definitely, I've written opinions that uh, that use it for one or another purpose. Can, can you think of an opinion in which it was dispositive? Yeah. So I think mostly it's not. I think mostly the way people use it now. And Justice Scalia has a point on this. He says, like, why bother using it that way? Mostly the way people use it now is to confirm everything that they do on other grounds, is, is to say, you know, here's what the text says, and here's what the structure says, uh, and here's how that fits with the overall design and purpose of the statute. And, uh, oh, by the way, we found this thing in the Senate report that tells us that everything we just did was right, right? And you know, I think that there is a kind of like, well, do you do you need that paragraph? You know, probably not. 
uh, it's, it's like gilding the lily, is that the expression? Or, you know, I think it's there was... Pa painting the lily, actually. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I think there was, uh, so I wrote pretty textual <laughs> dissent last year uh, where where I, uh, I get to legislative history and I said, I, I forget exactly the phrase, it's like um, icing on a cake already frosted, uh -huh. I think. And I think that that's mostly what people's treatment of legislative history is now at the court. So this is one where I think like, okay, so basically we're all doing the same thing and Justice Scalia just hasn't like said, by the way, I won, you know? So, so why do you think that is, right? So there, there are a bunch of arguments against using le legislative history. So when we went to law school, uh, I'll just read a quote from, from an opinion uh, called Overton Park, which is a famous administrative uh, law opinion, and this was uh, it from Overton Park, and it says, uh, the legislative history is ambiguous. Because of this ambiguity, it is clear that we must look primarily to the statutes themselves to find legislative Yeah, so that intent. is exactly what I was, that's a, such a great uh, quote, because it, it expresses exactly this thing that I was trying to get at when I was talking about reading all these FOIA opinions, that that's how the opinions exactly. read, right. which is really quite, it's like, well, God, we can't make a sense out of this story. The legislative history is all over the place. Guests will have to look at the text, you know? And that's just not the way anybody does anything anymore. I mean, I do think that legislative history, you said, is it ever dispositive? I, I mean, I think it can theoretically be. I mean, uh, the, uh, I think, uh, I think it was also in Milner that uh, that I have a line someplace where th where um, the government had some legislative history arguments and and I think I say something like you know, you, you uh, and, the, and this and those two where the legislative history was kind of all over the place as legislative history very frequently is you know it's like you have hundreds of people trying to sure. talk about something you end up getting lots of conflicting signals right and and I have this line that says, you know, basically, like a, a, a unclear legislative history, you know, can't trump a clear statute, right? That's perverse. But so but I hope you won't mind saying it's one of my favorite opinions, and I actually have the line right here: <laughs> "Those of us who make use of legislative history believe that clear evidence See, that of congressional." See, those of us who make use—that was right. probably put in so that Justice <laughs> Scalia could join the opinion. And he and he did. Yeah. <laughs> um, believe that clear evidence of congressional intent may illuminate ambiguous text. We will not take the opposite tack of allowing ambiguous legislative history to muddy clear statutory language, right? So that's, right. and do you think that's the way the rest of the court feels about it? Yes, I, I mean, I think that that, you, you know, eight people joined sure. that opinion, and uh, I think actually Justice Breyer would join that opinion, that statement too in a different context. So I think that that is the way. I, I do think, I mean, there there is the flip side that occasionally you see and you know, you said, is it ever, and maybe I can't figure out exactly when you say it, but at least as a theoretical matter, I think that there is the opposite. Suppose that you have a text that's uh, quite uncertain, that's quite ambiguous, and you use all your textual methods of trying to figure out the ambiguity, uh, uh, and you just still can't do it. And suppose that you had legislative history that of, of a, of, of a high quality, which means, let's say, sure. that it's like a Senate committee report rather than some floor statement or something, of a high quality that is actually remarkably clear, which occasionally you will find, I mean occasionally, uh, that sort of addresses the exact question before you and says this, this sure. is how we think it will work, all right? Then I see absolutely no problem, and I, I, I guess this is the difference between myself and just, I see absolutely no problem, I can't say it's, it's happened to me in the sure. last five years, you know? Which but is interesting in itself, yeah, right? I mean but I see absolutely no problem in saying, okay, well, look, you know, uh, you know the, the, uh, the text is mysterious, and they seem to have addressed exactly sure. this issue in the Senate report, so yes, that's, that's go with that. And, and do you feel that the court has moved in the direction that you've just described as a sort of a pragmatic, based on a kind of a pragmatic conclusion that the legislative history is unreliable? Is it on the sort of formal concern that it's not enacted? You know, what is, you know what, what's really behind it? Because th there's been a, a recent survey by um, uh, professors Gluck and Bressman uh, and published in, in two volumes of the Stanford Law Review, and they go around and they ask uh, a bunch of staffers 
about the way that Congress works, and the staffers came back and said, you know what, legislators are much more likely to read committee reports than they are the statutory text, and certainly the staffers who advise them are also more likely to read the committee reports than the statutory text, which is often, as we know, <laughs> really hard to read. Right. So why, why doesn't that kind of undo a lot of the critique of legislative history that got us to this point? Well, so I think a couple of things. I mean, the first is uh, that legislative history, at the way it used to be practiced at least, uh, and I think part of the resistance to it arose because it was uh, practiced in a pretty haphazard way. So it wasn't just the principal committee reports, which actually are written by the staff that are most involved in the bill and are the statement of what supposedly uh, they're thinking. But people used to use legislative history like um, you know, lots of different floor statements from individual legislators, lots of really complicated stories about drafting history, right? Once the, 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 the bill read like this, and then there was an amendment, and then it read like that, and sort of trying to figure out how, if you looked at the whole story of uh, the, the, how the legislation got enacted, you could sort of make sense of that. I think that they were trying to do this rather than that when they, when they uh, rejected that amendment or something like that. So a lot of it was very speculative. A lot of it was... Uh, so, we now know what one guy thinks. What does that have to do with anything? And I think that uh, that kind of legislative history is, you know, it's not, not much to be said for that. Um, I, now, I, I agree. Okay. <laughs> now, what there is, you know, I mean, I think that what you raise a good question about the, uh, the committee reports, the, the really the main documents. Because that is, I think, it's like an, you know, it's an executive summary of the legislation, and it is what a lot of people read. And for that reason, I think it ought to be given uh, greater weight. And in the, and those are the kinds of things that I say when there's ambiguity. Yeah, go read them. Um, uh, uh, but I think even there, you said you said it was formal, and I guess it's formal. But it's like it's you know it's 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 not what Congress passed, right? Uh, they want to pass a committee report. They can go pass a committee report. They they can incorporate a committee report into the legislation if they want to. Um, you know they didn't do that. We're looking at a law. Uh, you know again, I think it has to do with what the proper role of a judge is, and the proper role of a judge is to try to give effect to what Congress enacted, and maybe we could have a different governmental system that gave us a different job, but that's not the, the system that we have. And so, so can you use those things to, to, I mean, you know, sometimes just looking at the law does, I mean, we specialize sure. in all the perplexities and complexities and ambiguities that come from trying to make sense in, of, of, of these laws. and. And I guess I am a believer that you should use whatever tools are at hand. I'm also a believer in sort of ordering those tools in certain ways. But, uh, but that's the enterprise. The enterprise is not to like go with the committee report because right. that's the thing that people read really. Thank you. So could I, could I just ask you a question about the text now? The what? The text. The text. I thought we'd been talking about the text. Well, so. So this is, a, this is a, a, a kind of a special question about the text, because one of the things that you all do when you're reading the text is you use canons of construction. Now, when you and I were in law school, I think it's fair to say that if anybody had used the words expressio unius, eustem generis, noscitur asocius, I don't know if I'm pronouncing any of those correctly, um, in, in class, we, we would have been we would have been mocked pro probably, certainly by our classmates, maybe even by the professor, right? I mean, it, w it was just not, now never Justice raised. Now Justice Scalia mocks me for not pronouncing them right. <laughs> well, I, he, well, he mocks me too, okay. <laughs> um, uh, but it's, you know, now the court uses them all the time. And, yeah. you know, a whole, we have a whole segment of legislation and regulation about, about the canons. Yeah. So, now, Carl Llewellyn said he those has the, an amazing part of Justice Scalia's uh, most recent book. You know, goes through all the different canons, and it's it's uh, you know it's fantastic. He's sort of like it's a compendium of them all. It's very helpful. Everybody now they just go to Justice Scalia's book to check out which canon applies. 
So there are lots of them, right? There are. So that's what Carl Llewellyn said. There are so yeah, many of them like that this. if you find one, you can find the opposite one. And, yeah. and so are they really useful? I mean, your, your court uses a lot of Latin phrases now. And yeah. do they really, do those canons really help you decide cases? Do they help you figure out the meaning of the text? Well, uh, first, I guess, uh, so a, a bunch of different things. Uh, they're not all the same, of course. Uh, you know, some of them have more weight than others of them. So the fact that you can list 72 of them and see how some of them sometimes conflict with each other. Uh, but, you know, some of them actually are, do have a, 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 a greater weight. You know, they're, they're things that the court uses over and over again. So I wouldn't put them all on the same plan. Uh, the second thing is, I mean, I guess the way I think of it, I don't really, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know all the Latin phrases. I think of them usually as guides to reading language sensibly. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and mostly I think that, that what, r rather than, you know, go and like s memorize 50 canons, it's helpful to have an intuitive feel for how language works mm -hmm. and how the people who uh, write things think that language works. And that the canons are often just ways of formalizing those intuitions, uh, those correct intuitions about how people use language. So, uh, so they can be very helpful as that, as reminders of, uh, of, of what the, 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 of, of what it's sensible to, th uh, to think that the drafters meant to convey because the drafters use language in a certain um, common way. So, so if a statute says we may start collecting Social Security at age 65, we don't need a canon to say we can't start collecting it at 64. But it's, it's, it's always nice to cite something in Latin to make it seem more authoritative. Is that, I mean, is that a, or is that too, does that, is that? Yeah, I mean, I think that they actually play a little bit more of a role than that. I mean, but um, we had a case last week. I'll, I'll try this, to do this with, without at all giving anything away about uh, anything I think or anybody else thinks about the case. And it w was one, it was actually sort of this fascinating sort of what Llewellyn type moment. Because mm -hmm. the way the case came up to us, uh, it was very a, 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 a very fine opinion uh, by Judge Katzman on the Second Circuit, who now has a book out about statutory interpretation. Very good one, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and he said, the, the way it came up to us, he, he, he said, and, and the parties largely agreed with this, that it was two dueling canons. It was the dueling canons case. It was um, a, a, a phrase that I'm not going to be able to remember, but it was um, basically it, there were sort of three nouns followed by uh, a modifying phrase. And, and the question was whether the modifying phrase referred only to the last of the three noun phrases or whether it referred to all three of them. And uh, and there's one canon that says it refers to the last antecedent, right? So, I mean, here's, here's an example of this, which is actually made a little bit easier by the fact that, astonishingly, there is a comma in here that tells you what to do. But if I say, um, uh, well, he, he, uh, let me save this for a second. So there's one canon that goes, it says, uh, you, it just, the modifier just refers to the last antecedent. But there's another that says, if the noun phrases, if let's say the three noun phrases are enough alike, that they're kind of just a series of things, oh. and, and they're um, equivalently modified by the thing that comes after, then the modifier actually refers not just sure. to the last <coughs> antecedent, but to all of them. So here's an example of that, which is uh, if I say, um, you can't be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Does the without due process of law refer only to property, or does it refer to life or liberty too? So that's, uh, I think that was called the series modifier rule. So it was the series modifier rule versus the last antecedent rule. And that's sort of how the case was argued to us. And, you know, both of those things are things about how we commonly use language. And sometimes, 
uh, rules about how we commonly use language conflict with each other, and then you have to uh, make the best sense you can of it. And I won't give the answer away because, <laughs> you know. So it's, it's, a, it's about judgment, right? It's, it's about, about judgment. Yeah, and we make these judgments about, all the time. Right, it's about, it's about uh, good judgment as to the use of language. So in some sense, we, we can't, so in some sense, we don't need canons, and in, in another sense, we can't decode language without them, right? There, there are certain practices and conventions that we use to understand language, but I think they don't we could decode language without them. It's just that they give us uh, their reminders. They, you know, by, by, by naming things that we do when we try to make sense of language, it probably encourages us to think about the right things um, as we go about that process. So, so may I ask you about an opinion of yours in which uh, a canon uh, featured prominently? Um, so it's, it's the, the Yates decision. It involved the venerable canon Eustum Generis, uh, which is the canon that says when you have a list followed by a catch-all, you read the catch-all in light of the list. Um, uh, and so in, in that case, the question was this, uh, is a fish a tangible object, and the Supreme Court of the United States held that a fish is not a tangible object because uh, uh, the, word ta the words tangible object appeared in a list that started with records, documents, and or other, and other tangible objects, right? So it's the end of a list that had records and documents, and they said, well, it's got to be something like what preceded it in the list. You, you dissented, and, and for four justices, a very close case, concluded a fish is a tangible object. Shocking proposition, isn't it? Uh, well, have you, have you been to the dining hall? Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, so it, it... I take that as a slight, Dean, you know. <laughs> um, so so how, do you, how do you divide on that? question. Yeah, so the uh, first thing I'll say is if I live to the age of 150, I will never understand how the court reached the conclusion it did in that case. Um, uh, you know, usually I'm really very good at saying, um, on the other hand, I really understand why people who disagreed with me disagreed with me, and they really have some good points, and uh, I'm, I think uh, it's actually one of my strong points that I'm able to see what the world looks like from a different point of view. But honestly, I just don't see it in this case. <laughs> so uh, uh, we start, right? It's so th the phrase, the, the, the phrase in the statute was, uh, what is it? Records, Records documents, documents and or tangible things, yes. or tangible objects. Uh, tangible, tangible objects, objects, yes. Some of the other similar phrases were tangible things. Record document or tangible object, the whole thing was about evidence destruction and the question, and um, it, you know, it came up in a funny ha-ha kind of way because uh, there was a fisherman and there were rules about you have to throw fish of a certain size back into the water. You can't, uh, and, and his people came onto his boat and it turns out that he had been keeping much too small fish and the fish were the evidence in that case. So it's sort of, uh, you know, it's unusual, but the fish indeed were the evidence, and this was an evidence tampering statute. That's what the statute was all about. Now, is a fish a tangible object? Well, you know, obviously in a dictionary sense, I mean, even the majority agreed with this. The answer was, well, yes, of course, a fish is a tangible object. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, my view is that, uh, even if you expand your scope of vision, which I think it's important to do. One of the things I say in that opinion is you don't stop there. Everybody agrees that you don't stop with just a word or a phrase. You can look more broadly. You have to look more broadly. It turns out that like there are a thousand evidence tampering statutes that use the phrase record document or tangible object, and they always use it to mean like any evidence, and, uh, uh, you know, anything. Uh, it, you know, it could be, um, you know, if, you, if you're, a, if you're a, a, a murderer and uh, you uh, burn the diary in which you confess to the crime, uh, that's like a record or a document. But if you hide the body, that's just as much included. 
uh, in a whole world of these evidence tampering statutes, right? So, uh, and there was, there was a whole story of how these evidence tampering statutes came to be this way, that there was a model penal code provision which, clear, which made quite clear that it was referring to the whole world of evidence and not just written evidence. And, and that model penal code provision comes into lots of state evidence right. laws and, and comes into, and it's almost the exact same phrase was used in the federal statute and everybody agreed that it referred to non-documentary evidence as well as to documentary evidence. So this was like the one place in the entire world of evidence tampering statutes where the court insisted on, 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 on treating this phrase a different way, and I still don't understand why. But to get uh, to, to the, that canon, the, um, I mean, they did say, like, record, document, tangible object, you have to interpret tangible object in light of record and document, which it characterized as things that store information. So, you know, it could be written or it could be uh, virtual, but it had to be a store, th things that preserve information. And I guess I looked at it and I said, well, you know, even if you thought that this canon could trump the plain language, sure. the context, the structure, everything, even if you thought that this canon could trump that, you have to use the canon sensibly too. It's like the canon says you need a common denominator. But what is that common denominator? Is the common denominator you know, things that preserve information? Or in the context of an evidence tampering statute, is the common denominator things that provide information to an investigator, things that uh, tell an invest, you know, that uh, sure. say something up to an investigator about what the crime is. So, uh, I don't know. I still don't get it. So, so, <laughs> so what, one way of, of putting all of this, and, and I, I think it's, it, it covers everything from the first question to, to, to this last one, is that you're a textualist, you care about the text, you feel constrained by the text, you feel that that's how judges ought to behave, and that we also have to realize that textualism is not about looking in any way at the four corners of a document, it's holistic. You, you take a lot of different things into account, in, in this case, the history of the way similar statutes had been interpreted and that informs the, perhaps the, the, the enactment of this statute, that you look at the context of other words, you look at, you look at uh, some legislative history perhaps if it's ambiguous, that there are lots of things that inform the meaning of the words and that the words are ultimately uh, the constraint, but they, they're adopted in a rich legal environment. Would you say that's a fair characterization of your... Now, I'm, I'm going to carry you around with me. That's what, <laughs> uh, that, 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 that sounded pretty good to me. Done. Okay. So... I would want to want to look at it exactly to see if, if, that, if, I, if I agreed with all of that. Um, uh, I mean, I think I do, um, you, know, you know, what I'm trying to do is to interpret a text, right? right? That, uh, that there is that that uh, appropriate constraint, um, uh, you know, that I'm not writing it, I'm not making it up, you know, Congress has done that, I'm just trying to interpret it. And I think that there's an order of things that you, you know, that you, for, you, you look at the text, you look at the context, you look at the structure, if things are still in, unclear, you start thinking about how canons might apply, if things are still unclear after that, you might go to particularly useful uh, legislative history so that there's a kind of ordering process that gives discipline to the inquiry. Uh, and, you know, you, 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 uh, you, you stop when you, uh, when you think that you've resolved the ambiguity, whatever ambiguity is there, as best you can. Thank, thank you, Justice Kagan. Do, so I think we have about 10 minutes. Would it be okay if we open the floor for some questions from our students or colleagues. Pro Professor Elhaig. Hi. Um, so you emphasize the importance of starting with the text and staying within the judicial role. Uh, but sometimes, no matter how sophisticated your textualism, it you had ambiguous results. And I think broadly speaking, there's two conceptions of the judicial role in those cases. There's 
what I call the partnership model, which basically says, well, if Congress wanted to say something, but it was unclear about exactly what it means, judges should act like partners, fitting it sensibly into the rest of the legal corpus. And then the other model is sort of the honest agent model, which says, well, in those cases, even if it's unclear what Congress meant, we try to recreate what they're most likely to have won, some sort of model that. So what, which of those do you see as the judicial role in textual ambiguity cases or sort of third version? Um, well, you know, I, 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 I guess I'm going to resist the premise of the question a little bit, which is to say that one just finds oneself stuck at a certain point and, uh, and it's just a hopeless muddle and you have to pick something. I think that actually the world doesn't much work like that. Um, but I think if you use these various tools of interpretation, mostly you get to one answer that seems to me better than another answer. So um, uh, maybe I can, uh, there was a, um, another case that I wrote a few years ago, uh, which was, had to do with, uh, with gun laws, all right? It's a case called Abramski. And, and the, the, you know, what the gun laws do is they basically say that when you walk into a gun dealer, um, the gun dealer has to check who you are and has to run your name through a system in order to make sure that you're not a felon. And uh, you know you know the basic idea of these gun laws, right? But um, so the gun, so the way this, this statute was written, it kept on referring to persons and transferees when it talked about who the gun dealer was supposed to. Uh, uh, who the gun, you know, who, who the gun dealer was supposed to run through the system in order to make sure that they weren't a felon, all right? And the question comes up, well, how about if the guy at the counter is a straw purchaser, meaning that there's been an arrangement made where he's just going to give the gun over to somebody else, right? So who's the buyer or who's the transferee or who's the person in that uh, context? Is it the guy at the counter? Or is it the person who's actually going to get the gun, all right? And this is like a fundamentally unclear thing about the statute. And this also was a 5-4 opinion. And it was a 5-4 opinion because you have to say that they wrote this statute and it was fundamentally uncertain as to who the transferee was, right? And so Justice Scalia said, what are you talking about, the transferee or the person is the person at the counter. So as long as the person at the counter gives his name, you just run that name through the system and that's what, and, but on the other hand, that seemed, uh, you know, that seemed actually not right to me clearly as a matter of the language that maybe the transferee was the guy who was actually going to get the thing and who was always known to get the thing. I mean, these straw purchases would stand there at the counter and they would hand over some cash and then just like hand it right over to the guy who was going to come away. So it was a fundamental ambiguity in the statute. Now, I guess my view was, well, then you kept thinking about the statute and you kept thinking about uh, what the statute was designed to do. And the way that opinion sort of reads is I go through all the different mechanisms that the statute uses and I talk about like what the point of all of those mechanisms are and basically say the point of all those mechanisms is to make sure that the guy who's going to, in the end, come away with the gun is the guy who we're checking as a felon or not, right? And that to me was a pretty commonsensical way of resolving uh, 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 the ambiguity in these words. So I don't know which like model that exactly is, I guess what I would say is there are ambiguities in language that are just going to exist in the statute and that one of the things you do is you think about the design of the statute as a whole and try to make those ambiguities come out <coughs> in a way that, is, uh, that makes sense in light of the entire statute and its design. Other questions? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on the dean. <laughs> Don't students get to ask anything? Uh, if they raise their hands, we'll, we've got. <coughs> so 
I'll be, I'll be quick. Is there a constitutional dimension to this theory of statutory interpretation? Or is it just the like? <laughs> well, I guess there is in the sense of, I mean, this is what uh, Professor Manning was talking about, about um, what a judge's proper role is, right? Wh where does that come from? It, it, you know, in the end comes from the difference between Article I and Article Three of the Constitution. And it suggests why congressmen do one thing and judges do another different thing, and that we should keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, I mean, look, uh, I, I guess, you know, th there's plenty of important stuff that judges do. And I don't think we should necessarily, um, I don't think we uh, strike the necessary, I mean, we, sh we shouldn't take over the roles of other branches of government. Uh, and, uh, and, and the Constitution tells us not to. And, uh, you know, we're not masters of the universe, we're not emperors, we're not kings, and we're not Congress. And uh, so is that a constitutional proposition? Yes. Any students? Uh, how about here in, this, in the third row? When the question that you're asking is whether Congress has spoken to the, answering is whether Congress has spoken to the precise question at issue, um, not actually what the best reading of the statute is, if you use the same typology, and if so, if you think there's more disagreement among your colleagues of that your typology is the right one to use. When we're trying to figure out whether there is ambiguity, um, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, is, is sort of interesting. I, I, uh, a, a, a while ago, uh, Professor Manning asked me what were some differences that I have with Justice Scalia. And we talked a little bit about legislative history differences. I think that there's another difference, which, is, which has to do with um, the, the quickness with, w w uh, with which we find ambiguity. In other words, some people, I think uh, very rarely say this just is ambiguous. And, and I think some people more frequently say, yes, this is ambiguous. And, and you often see that in a Chevron type context. You also see it, I mean, this was part of my dispute with Justice Scalia in this case that I just talked about with Professor Elhag, because what Justice Scalia said was like, the buyer only means one thing, or the transferee only means one thing. It means the guy at the counter. And I said, well, why does the transferee only mean the guy at the counter as opposed to the guy who actually has paid for and is going to come away with the gun? And so where I saw ambiguity, Justice Scalia saw clarity. And once he saw clarity in what that word meant, you know, he thought that the game was up, and I thought, actually, the game has just started. Uh, and, and, and I do think that there is a difference uh, among justices uh, 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 as, as to that question, is like how, how m the degree to which we, uh, uh, just d d d how easily we, f yeah, um, that some people think things are clear in, uh, in, in circumstances in which other people think there's still a lot of question marks. And I don't know why that is exactly, whether that's almost a question of personality. He is a confident fellow, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, that's one possibility, that there is some yeah. sort of temperamental uh, differences here that yeah. have nothing to do with anything other than that. Yeah. Uh, uh, or what, what else might it have to do with, uh, uh, you know, the ease with which people find, yes, this is clear? I'm not sure. I do think it's, I do think it's, it, it may be temperament. Um, you know, I think statutes are, are complicated, and I'm, I'm actually a little bit surprised at the number of times that your court concludes that a case that has come before it largely on the basis of splits in opinion yeah. from the lower courts, how often your court will conclude that a statute that has come to it is, is clear. Yeah, uh, well, well, I guess I would say a couple of things about that. Uh, you can tell this is a great question because it's, I'm not quite sure how to answer it. But uh, uh, you know, one thing is that sometimes you really do look at a case and say, 
I don't really understand how all these courts split on this. It actually does seem pretty clear to me. And, and, and those are the kinds of cases that often lead to these 9-0 decisions, even though there's been a 6-4 to four circuit split or something. Um, uh, uh, but, 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 but other times, I mean, we say something is clear in the end, but it's only after having gone through a very extensive process, right, of looking at a lot, of using a lot of different tools, of looking at a lot of different things, <coughs> of, you know, starting with dictionaries, but then really thinking very widely about structure and context, about using canons, about looking to legislative history. And then finally, when you do all of that, it's like, okay, you arrive at an answer. That doesn't mean that the getting there has necessarily been easy. So I, I, I think we're out of time. And I just want to say thank you, Justice Kagan, for coming here and giving us an opportunity to have an, a sort of inside view into the way you and, and your colleagues think about statutes. Thank you for your candor and your wisdom and your clarity. And we're, we're just delighted to have you back. And, and thank you for being uh, the Scalia Lecturer this year. Liz, it's really fun. Thank you.